All right, it is 2.33, so we can get started. So thanks um, to all of us for, well, all, of, all of you for joining us today. Uh, this is the third political economy session of the CSE conference this year, and we are excited to have a set of very four, uh, very exciting four papers that are coming your way. Just uh, to highlight a few kind of ground rules, each presenter is going to get 15 minutes. I will let the speakers know when there's five minutes and two minutes left. And then we're going to keep all the Q and A's for for the final kind of 20, 30 minutes. You can write your questions either in the kind of the Q and A function through Zoom, and I will will kind of monitor those, and then we can we can call on you to ask the question at the end. Otherwise, you can also just raise your hand at the at the end during the Q and A, and then call on you to ask your question. So without uh, wasting any more time, I'm going to ask Juliette to share our screen and to get us started. Thank you. Am I sharing my screen? No. So I got lost. Yeah. Um, so could could someone else present first? Uh, so this is on my computer and uh, something went wrong. Uh, Eleonora, are you happy to, to get us started? Sorry. Of course, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Great. All right. So uh, we have Eleonora who's like, jumping in to get us started, so thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for putting my paper in the program. Uh, my name is Eleonora Guarnieri, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Exeter. And today I'm going to present what used to be my job market paper. Um, and let me start by, okay, let me first tell you the title. So it's about cultural distance and ethnic civil conflict. And I'm sure this is kind of not needed for this type of audience, but let me start just by defining civil conflict. Oops, sorry. I'm also not completely, okay. So civil conflicts are instances of intrastate conflict in which one or multiple armed groups decide to rebel against the central government of a state. And why should we study this type of conflict? Well, since the end of World War II, this has been by far the most common form of war that has been fought all around the world. And it has also been the deadliest. So it's estimated that the death toll uh, coming from civil conflict has been five times as high as the death toll coming from international conflict, meaning conflict between countries. And needless to say, this phenomenon comes with disastrous, long-lasting consequences that are both economic, but also psychological for entire communities. And despite this, the importance of this phenomenon also for a variety of development outcomes, the determinants of civil conflict remain largely debated. So given that since the end of World War II, roughly half of all civil conflicts that have been fought all around the world have been fought along ethnic lines, there is some established literature that has both theoretically and empirically looked at the role of ethnic diversity measure at the country level in explaining uh, the likelihood that a given country is going to experience conflict. And what this literature has found and shown also theoretically is that indeed more ethnically diverse countries tend to experience more conflict on average. But despite this, um, you know, by nature, all ethnic groups in a country face the same level of diversity in the aggregate. So it still remains quite unclear within the literature on diversity of conflict, why is it that some ethnicities within the same country decide to rebel against the central government and others do not. And it's also not clear why they do so sometimes and not at other times. So the goal of this paper is to shed a light on this question by moving the analysis of diversity and conflict from the country level to the ethnic group level and to focus on the role of each ethnic group's cultural distance to the ethnicities that are forming the central government at a given point in time. And by cultural distance, I mean all these sets of differences in beliefs, values, and preferences between two given ethnic groups. Based on the theoretical literature on the topic, the main focus of my paper is going to be a specific type of ethnic civil conflict meaning conflicts over government power, in which groups rebel with the aim of replacing the central government or changing its composition. 
And this is a very common form of war and accounts for two thirds of African civil conflicts that have been fought in the post-colonial era. And post-colonial Africa is precisely the focus uh, of my empirical analysis. So what I'm going to test uh, is the following hypothesis. I hypothesize that an increase in cultural distance to the government should increase an ethnicity's propensity to fight and more precisely to fight in order to achieve government power. And why is this the case? Well, by nature, every group in a country is subject to the public policies that the government provides, whether one likes, one likes them or not. And when in power, you can assume that an ethnicity is going to implement the mix of public policies that best reflect uh, the preferences of, the, of a given group. And therefore, if there are differences in preferences, if, if there are diverging preferences over that mix of public policies, well, this is going to generate disagreement. And this disagreement may result into conflict, open conflict to gain power. So to test this hypothesis, I assemble a novel data set using a variety of sources which ends up being a panel of 236 African ethnic groups, which I call potential rebels, because these are groups that in principle at every point in time could engage in conflict against the government. I basically follow this set of ethnic groups over 57 years from 1961 to 2017. And this kind of coincides with the post-colonial era in Africa. I track each group's involvement in civil conflict for every year in which I observe uh, these African ethnicities and distinguish between conflicts that are fought over government power and conflicts that, that are more territorial. And this is going to be my main dependent variable. My main explanatory variable is a measure, measure of cultural distance of each ethnic group to all the ethnicities forming the central government. And to this end, I use linguistic distance, which is a pretty standard measure in the literature, and basically captures the idea that different languages are basically the result of horizontal separations between populations, which are likely to go hand in hand with cultural divergence. So the universe of, of observation in my analysis is going to be an ethnicity in a country in a year. And to identify the effect of cultural distance on conflict, I leverage within ethnicity variation in cultural distance, which stems from changes in the ethnic identity of the government. And in my sample, I have 138 of such changes. And based on this identifying variation, I propose three complementary research designs, each of which allows me to address different identification challenges. And today I'm just, for the sake of time, going to focus on the very general one, the first one, which is a simple linear probability model in which I include all African ethnicities, so the universe of African ethnic groups. And I basically regress my dependent variable, conflict involvement, on my main explanatory variable, linguistic distance. And I'm able to include a full set of ethnicity and country by year fixed effects. And I'm going to describe what this can buy me later on in the empirical strategy. So to address uh, some other identifying con other concerns with identification, I then also exploit the sample of African groups that were partitioned across countries um, during the scramble for Africa. And this buys me an additional level of variation and allows me to include also a full set of uh, ethnicity by year fixed effect to account for uh, time specific ethnic shocks. And then I also, to address some remaining endogeneity concerns uh, when it comes to cultural distance and conflict meaning linguistic distance, I also propose a novel instrumental variable approach that unfortunately I won't have time to talk about today, um, which is based on a prehistoric cultural shock, which is specific to Sub-Saharan Africa, the so-called Bantu expansion, which was a massive prehistoric migration of the Bantu tribe from southwestern Cameroon throughout Sub-Saharan Africa that basically impacted and affected the cultural capital of some groups, but not others. Now, to give you an illustration of my data set and the identifying variation I'm exploiting, I'm here proposing an example from Congo. So 
the map displays the five ethnic groups uh, in Congo defined by the EPR data set. And it shows you where they are located across the country. And basically each of these groups can potentially rebel against the central government. So each of these five groups is potentially a rebel. And this is what I call uh, potential rebels. And here I'm displaying an extract for the Lariba Congo ethnic group from 1996 to 1999. And as you can see, I assign an ethnic identity to the government for each year. And then I compute a measure of linguistic distance between each of these groups, in this case, the Lariba Congo, and the set of ethnicities that are composing the government coalition. I then track each group's involvement in conflict and I distinguish between conflict over power and conflict for territory. And basically, as you can see, the within ethnicity variation in my independent variable stems from changes in the ethnic identity of the government, such as the one that Congo experienced in 1998. So with this in mind, and with this identifying variation in mind, I am now ready to show you my empirical strategy. So I, in my first empirical design, what I do is I regress my conflict indicator which is a binary variable equal to one if a given ethnic group R, a potential rebel, is fighting the government of country C in year T and zero otherwise. And then my main explanatory variable is my measure of cultural distance, meaning linguistic distance between a given ethnic group R and the set of ethnicities forming the government of country C in a given year T. And then what I can include is a full set of ethnicity fixed effects, as well as in some specifications, also ethnicity specific year trends. So by including ethnicity fixed effects, I'm basically ensuring that I'm isolating the role of cultural distance from any other time invariant ethnic specific characteristic that could be associated with conflict. And here you can think about many things such as you know, given ethnicity's cultural capital, overall aggressiveness, and so on. I can yeah, also, no. yes? Five minutes. Perfect, thank you. I can also include a full set of country by year fixed effects, we would, which would account for any characteristics at the country level, both time invariant and time variant, as well as for the characteristics of a given government. So, uh, whether a certain government is more, uh, I don't know, autocratic than others and so on, as well as institutions in general, okay? I also control for a set of geographic and climatic dis differences between potential rebel and the government, just to make sure that my results are not confounded by mere geographic differences or climatic differences. And I, standard my, I cluster my standard errors two way by country and year. So let me show you my main results. I find that an increase in cultural distance to the government significantly increases the propensity of an ethnicity to fight over government power. I find that a one standard deviation increase in cultural distance increases conflict over power by 7.5 percentage points, which is a considerably large effect if you consider the, the average conflict prevalence in the sample, which is 4.9%. Uh, now, you may wonder, is this due to cultural differences or is this just a mechanical effect given that if an ethnicity is represented in the government coalition, then well, its linguistic distance is gonna be mechanically smaller than another ethnicity that is not represented. So I want to make sure that it is indeed cultural dif distance. And that, that is why I control for the role of potential confounders, meaning whether or not an ethnicity is represented in the government or not, and also whether an ethnicity has recently lost power and may be uh, more uh, likely to rebel to regain it. And what you can see is that the coefficient remains uh, remarkably similar, suggesting that indeed the interpretation of the coefficient is correct. Now, a short note on the mechanisms, even if, we, if it is cultural distance that impacts conflict, the question of why uh, remains open. Why is it that ethnic groups are more likely to fight the government if they are culturally distant from them? And theory here suggests kind of two 
competing or very different explanations. So according to the models by Esteban and Ray, it's really, and the scholar in Baxter as well, it's really due to a cultural disagreement. Deep-rooted cultural norms shape diverging preferences over public policies that everyone must share. And if there are disagreements, then this is kind of what triggers conflict. But then there is also the model by Caselli and Coleman, who actually argue, well, um, linguistic distance is kind of an ethnic marker, which facilitates discrimination. So conflict is triggered not much by how culturally different we are and what difference, how our preferences are different, but it's more because it is easier for the government to discriminate against a linguistically distant group because it's easier to mark these people as not members of their group. Two more minutes. Thank you. So I'll provide you, uh, and then I conclude some evidence in favor of um, the first mechanism. And in the paper, I also kind of rule out uh, the second one. And I first show that indeed, uh, respondents to surveys, and in this case, I'm using the Afrobarometer survey, if these respondents are very culturally distant to the government, well, then they are more likely to dislike or to disagree on the performance of the government on various dimensions or the way they provide infrastructure, education, and so on and so forth. And this is the first piece of evidence. The second piece of evidence comes from a kind of falsification exercise, which I conduct borrowing notions again from theoretical work uh, on conflict. And basically what theory suggests is that if it's really about cultural differences and differences in preferences over public policies, well, then we should not expect that more culturally distant groups engage in more conflict over territory, which is more of a rival good. And according to Spolar and Baxter model, this should be more likely among similar groups. And indeed, I do not find a statistically significant effect here. If anything, the coefficient re is reversed in sign, but significant only in some specifications. So let me then conclude. I provided evidence or tried to shed light on why which ethnic groups are more likely to rebel at a given point in time and why. And the contribution of my paper is that I move the analysis of diversity and conflict from the country level to the ethnic group level. I show that conflict is a function not only of the characteristics of a given ethnic group, and there is some literature on this, but we should start considering the characteristics of both potential sides involved in a conflict. And my paper also shows that consider, considering the issue over which combatant fights, in this case, government or territory, is also important if we really want to uh, efficiently study the determinants of conflict. So I think I'm out of time. Um, just as a policy, maybe suggestion, um, understanding when an ethnicity is more likely to rebel is also crucial for policy if we want to target conflict prevention efforts. So thank you very much. Thanks, Elena, for this uh, great paper and also for uh, switching time at the last minute. So thanks for that. No We're going to try again with uh, Juliette now. Let's see if it works. Thanks. Uh, hopefully it will. Um, yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, yes. Thanks for the uh, great presentation, Elena, and thanks for like um, helping me <laughs> and taking the first slot. Um, so I'm Juliette crespin -Bucot. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at eBay in Barcelona, and this is joint work with uh, Catherine Brun, who is at DLSC, and Alex Moadi, who is at the University of Bozen Bozano. It's still a work in progress, and I'm flying to Kenya in two weeks to talk to people and try to collect some um, information and in additional databases. So if you have feedback or suggestions, they would be very welcome. And so in this project, we're interested in the link between ethnic homogenization and um, levels of public good provision, uh, in part because there's this vast literature linking uh, ethnic diversity to lower levels of public good provision. Uh, we use a natural experiment, uh, a land reform in Kenya that took place shortly um, after independence, so during the first decade after independence. And so, the most of the European settlers 
left Kenya, sold the land to the government, and then the Kenyan government then redistributed the land uh, for fee, so not for free, uh, to Kenyan beneficiaries. And what's of special interest to us is that land allocation was based on ethnicity. So these program areas uh, become more heterogeneous than the comparable neighboring areas. So a bit more on the background in a, in a couple of slides. And so we use a spatial regression discontinuity design. So we use a novel that I said that um, has the geographic location of all the exact borders of this land reform areas. And we can, the treatment is belonging to one of these program areas that became less homogeneous than the neighboring areas. And our identification hypothesis is that these exact borders of the program areas are random. And the outcome of interest we, we use so far is primary and secondary schools. We have data for 64, 78, and 2007. It's an interesting uh, public good because some schools in Kenya were built and provided for by the central government, while some, especially in the 60s and 70s, were built by communities. So depending on the cases, it can be like a locally provided public good, or it can be provided by the central government. Um, for a caveat is that we solely have information on who is providing for the schools in 2007. So I'm, I'm trying to get access to the school censuses from earlier periods, so we can tell you more about whether it's a story about how the government is targeting public goods, or whether it's a story about more um, local provision of public goods. And to, to link this paper also with the, the one that was just presented, schools are also a public good for which the preferences are arguably more like more similar across ethnic groups, especially in Kenya, uh, than, than other public goods. So that's also, uh, we, it's probably not a story about preferences. And so this uh, paper relates to um, three strands of the literature, um, the one on ethnic fractionalization and public good provision. We have quite uh, contrasting results with um, the main take of this uh, papers, who on, which on average conclude that ethnic heterogeneity is associated to lower levels of public good provision. It's also related to the literature on the resettlement and nation building policies and more in line with a paper by Pazi on Indonesia, we find that these communities that became less fractionalized have the same level of public goods than the others. And finally, we also contribute to the literature on the local origins, on the origins of local levels of uh, ethnic diversity. A, a quick background on land uh, in Kenya. So during the colonial period, there were three categories of land. First, the European settlers area or the so-called White Highlands, uh, which was the part of the country in which land was alienated by the, by the British government. And so the Africans could not own land in this part of the country, but often worked on settlers farms and most of the time at their own small plot, they could also farm. And um, it was, this part of the country was also a contested territory between different ethnic groups at the, the end of the 19th century and had low population density. So some part of this territory didn't clearly belong to one ethnic group or another. The second category of land is the African land units or the so-called native reserves that were basically units based on ethnic groups, homelands or the, the British administration understanding of these units and where Africans could then uh, own land and, and work. Uh, and finally, the last category is crown land, but it's mostly in the northeastern part of the country. And that's not what we're interested in. So a map of Kenya, you can see in light gray, this um, European settler area. You can see in black, the program areas, the land that was redistributed during the first decade after independence, and in white, this kind of African land units. 
So at independence, the government, they, they were this um, huge demand for land redistribution. And so this, there was um, the government transferred about 500,000 hectares from the European settlers to about 4% of the Kenyan population as of the 62 census. So it's a really large scale land reform program. And um, the aim of the program was to address land grievances, especially this, um, the idea that people needed to be allowed to own land in their ancestral homelands. So there was this ethnicity dimension, but part of the program was also about making sure that the agricultural production of Kenya would not collapse right after independence. So the this explains why there are these two sets of criteria of beneficiaries. The first one being income and skills. So this was about, they wanted skilled farmers who could handle very large farms. And then the, two, the last two were about residents. So you were given priority if you had already worked on the land during the colonial period and ethnicity. So if you, so each, each kind of plot was, allocated to an ethnic group clustered together based on this um, homelands. And then people who were not from the correct ethnic groups were removed and transferred to another part of the country where they would then be given that. And an important part uh, of the, this reform is that the land was not given out for free. The beneficiaries had to reimburse a loan. So this, this will help us argue that we can neutralize income effects in a way because it's not a, a direct uh, redistribution of the land. A quick word on what happens on this areas that we would call the counterfactual areas. So these areas that were also in this European settlers area, but that did not become part of the program. So for the most part, this the European settlers left. And so there were land buying companies that bought the land and redistributed it. So we think of it as a form of private land reform. And the, the fact is, if you look at pictures, satellite images from the sky, it, they look very similar. So they uh, bought this huge, large plots and then subdivided them and sold them to Kenyan farmers. And then some other things happened, but mostly not in the areas we're working on. And huge table, but this is to show that indeed, so we use the censuses from 62, so right before independence and the one of 89, to show that, as you can see in the first four columns, um, before um, in 62 being in this European settler area, so that the first two rows was associated to a higher ethnic fractionization index than in the rest of the country. And then as you see in columns from five to eight, then whichever measure we use, being in this program area, now they are like, they cannot be distinguished from the former African land units that are extremely homogeneous because they were based also on ethnicity. And this is what we see using DHS trying to look more at the borders. So there is a lot of noise, but we do see a jump, a small one, but uh, uh, we do see also this jump at the border using DHS data that, that we don't see in the, in the other. And then on the left, you can see the treated and versus our counterfactual and the plot on the right, it's showing that basically they became like this former uh, native reserves. There's just a summary. Juliette, so, Juliette you have yes. five more minutes. Okay, perfect, thanks. So just a summary of type of land. So we have this program areas that we're going to compare to the counterfactual areas. We're also comparing the program areas directly to the African land units and the African land units to the counterfactual, but I don't, I won't have time to show you these results. Um, so a quick word on the identification assumption. The, why we argue that this border is as good as random at the local level is that the land was bought from European farmers. So it wasn't, there was no expropriation. 
So there were these budget constraints and state capacity constraints that meant that the state has to stop somewhere buying land. And then they stopped at the border of plot boundaries that were delimited, delimited in early 20th century. So it's most of them are like straight lines because they drew these plot boundaries on maps when they had little knowledge of what was there. We do test using altitude. And um, so we don't have really solid quality measures, but at least with altitude, we don't have issues. And we have some historical maps that we would use to, to try to show a bit more uh, results regarding this um, identification assumption. So we use um, the regular uh, regression discontinuity model. The important thing to say is that we're using cells, like pixels, as unit of analysis, not villages, because colonization and then land redistribution disrupted settlement patterns. So we don't really have villages that would be exogenous to the treatment. So we have pixels and we look at what's inside the pixel mostly. Is there a school? Is there not a school? Um, so we find when we compare our program areas to the counterfactual, when we look at 64 and 78, so in the short run, we see no differences. So basically, this, this places start looking the same pretty fast, mostly because there is almost nothing on the African lineage side. So it's not like this new program areas have to catch up with a, a, another place in which a lot of things would be happening. No, like in 60, before independence, there are virtually no schools in the country. So in the longer run, we see that population is still higher uh, on this uh, treated side than in the counterfactual side. Uh, we see that in these program areas, the fields are smaller and they are a bit less large fields than in the counterfactual. And when we look at schools, we see no difference in the number of schools, the number of students. We also check with po polling stations, no difference. We try to um, take into account uh, school per capita using Vernite polygons, and we still find no differences. We use um, majority ethnic group fixed effects and still find no differences. And so it seems that the, um, the number of school is indeed very similar um, across the border. Juliette, two minutes. Yeah, thank you. And so we think this is not due to the direct impact of the land reform program. We do a test using field side as a proxy for income ensure that doesn't change the results. And we think that our results are mostly in line with the new, the most recent work on ethnic diversity and public good provision that argue that um, ethnic diversity is a proxy for weak social networks. And so we, is, our conclusion is basically that on the treatment as on the control side, uh, people were just resettled there after the colonial period. So they all lack this dense social networks that allow to provide schools or demand action for politicians. And so that's why we, we don't find an effect. And um, yes, as a, just the next steps. So we have this historical maps that we want to use to do more work on why some plots were included in the uh, programs and why some were not. And we are trying to get some new data on public goods, especially this like school censuses from the 60s, 70s, 80s, to be able to track who is providing schools over time, and especially to disentangle kind of government targeting public goods in one area and then communities responding and providing schools in the neighboring one or the reverse or, or NGO stepping in. So, so far we, we don't know. It's kind of, it's still pretty much a black box what is happening with respect to um, who, is, who is providing uh, schools. And we're also working to process some data on income to be able to tell a bit more about the, the income effect. That's it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Juliette, and gr great that it computer wise it worked as well. So we can move on to, uh, to Dan now. Thank you so much, guys. Can everyone see me? Uh, yes, at least I can. Slides. Okay. <laughs> more important the slides. 
Thank you very much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. So um, this paper is with uh, Ravi Samani, who was a postdoctoral researcher here at the Bureaucracy Lab, which I lead at the bank. Um, but we're going to not talk too much about the internal workings of public administration, but rather one of the outcomes, which is the quality of infrastructure um, that uh, in, in particular, we're going to be focusing on water points. And um, what do I mean by that? I mean a borehole or a well that many of you will have seen dotted all across um, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, one of the other things you'd have seen is how many of them <clears throat> are not functional at any time, at any specific time. So about 40% of, of water points in sub-Saharan Africa are not functioning at any one time. And uh, the, the question that we wanted to ask was, is there a political economy um, component uh, to, to why we see uh, the very substantial wastage of, of water points over the, uh, over the region. And so really our big question is, what determines the nature and functionality of, of water points in sub-Saharan Africa? And what we do is we focus on electoral incentives uh, with the idea that um, water is a, a key uh, resource. Individuals uh, care about receiving it in uh, their, uh, who they're going to vote for. And so what we do is we look at whether there's differences just before and after elections um, as incentives for politicians change in the quality of the water point uh, in infrastructure that's provided. And what we show is that there is persistent effects, uh, whether water points were implemented just before and just after. And the, the effect that, that we show is, is not just in one country. We try to do this using water point data from three countries, Nigeria, Syria alone, and Tanzania. And we try to do this in the longest possible um, panel across the, the three countries, although it does vary, and I'll, I'll explain later exactly the, the years we use. And so we're sort of exploring this question in a bit of a regional as well as country by country. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present results three times, and they're consistent throughout. So what we find is that infrastructure installed in the run-up to an election is significantly more likely to be functioning today uh, than those installed shortly after elections. So our interpretation of this is that politicians are responding to electoral incentives for good quality public goods just before elections. Um, by adjusting the technology, as, as we'll show you, we can't provide causal evidence, but our sense is that the mechanism is that they change the technology and the, the provider of installed water systems. What they do is they basically contract out of the public sector more as you come up to elections to the private sector who do a better job and so that infrastructure lasts for longer. Now we are not testing a model here, the data is um, you know very deep in the sense that it's, it's providing us uh, an assessment of the functionality of water points today for the census of all water points but the granularity of the data doesn't really allow us to say what's going on inside the political bargain here. Our motivating model is about myopia and the idea that uh, the judgment of individual uh, citizens on their politicians is more heavily weighted just before elections than four years ago. And so we use the fact that the three countries have often had regular electoral cycles to say that in the years just before the election, providing high quality public goods increases the amount of, uh, of political support. But then the incentive to provide high quality public goods just after the election, given the fact that voters in four years aren't going to remember those investments nearly as well as those just before, that falls. And so you have this discontinuity just at the election time. So this is a, a kind of exposition that we give to motivate the argument rather than a model to test. Our data comes from an excellent resource, and we uh, suggest that everyone takes a look at this. Uh, it's the Water Point Data Exchange. And so in the three countries that we use, there is a real census that we think is argument it's, it's defensible. But in other countries, there is some degree of assessing the quality of water points across the country. Um, in the three countries that we choose, because it's, it's got the best data, uh, we really are uh, looking at a census of all of all boreholes. And so because these are physically uh, 
relatively difficult to degrade objects, you know, piece of concrete with a bit of metal stick into it, um, we can observe those water points for a very long period. We see water points from throughout um, the 1970s and onwards for Nigeria and Tanzania. We cut the data in Sierra Leone because of the civil war, because of course that was a, a degree of exogenous damage that we didn't want to take into account. So we're only using um, from, from peace onwards in, in Sierra Leone. So what's the context is, as I said, there's, there's quite a degree of, of failure in water points. And this means a lot of people without access to water. And so this varies slightly over the, the three countries. Similarly, um, the type of technology used does vary across the countries, but um, you know, frequently you're seeing quite a lot of variation. So individual uh, contractors, politicians, sometimes uh, communities are investing in a technology, are investing in the creation of water points throughout the period. And what we're going to see is that varies by the cycle as well. That's going to be part of our mechanism story. So just to give you a, a first sense, what these graphs are going to show you is a two year bandwidth around an election. And so in the two years running up, what we see is a slow increase towards um, an, in, an increased likelihood of that borehole surviving to today. And then just after the election, if it was created a, a, just after an election, we see a distinct fall here in Nigeria in the likelihood of that water point um, surviving to today. And we see that across our three settings. So here's Sierra Leone, here's the RDD, the event study, and similarly in Tanzania. Here's the regression results. So what we're doing is we're trying to absorb linear trends in time. Uh, we have district controls and, and fixed effects. And we do take quite a range of different uh, uh, approaches. I'm, I'm going to just show you here that the plain RDD estimates for time, but in the paper you'll see our robustness checks. And consistently throughout the three countries, either you can take individual case studies of a country, but what's nice is we get very similar results across countries that just after an election, the probability of observing a water point uh, today is about, uh, it depends, four to, to eight percent uh, lower survival rates than if it was implemented just before the election. So um, what does this mean? Well, it means people um, don't receive water when those water points fail. So if we imagine an accountability system in which water or the incentives to, to provide water was uniform across uh, our, our setups, so there was no discontinuity, then we would have uh, 2000, these are the numbers that we estimate, sort of 2,670, 3,000, 1,500 additional water points across these countries. And because, of course, many people access each of them, we're talking about millions of individuals with greater access to water today. Our robustness, as I said, takes into account quite a range of different ways to, to try and estimate those IDDs and the event studies, um, trying to keep up with the debate that's going on at the moment in, in economics as to how best to approach um, these sorts of estimations. So the, the question is, why do we see what we see? Um, and we are not able, as I said, to give causal evidence on mechanisms, but we provide evidence that what's happening is that private contractors are being used to implement the projects and they are using superior technology. They're using uh, more complicated pipe work, reticulation. They may use better um, uh, uh, infrastructure to sort of draw the water out. We do also test for whether bureaucratic or political disruption um, is, is affecting our results. For example, we can get rid of the year before and after. We can try and uh, change the way that we measure the continuity of politics and so forth. And we don't find evidence that any of that is, is explaining our results. So overall, uh, what this paper tries to do is provide empirical evidence from three countries in sub-Saharan Africa. We're, not really trying to make too much of the idea that these are coherent settings. But what's nice about that is that it adds support to the results from any single country. And, and that's relatively rare in microeconomic studies, but particularly in political economy. And so we're sort of arguing that 
providing evidence from these three settings, you know, allows us to sort of better sense whether these are stylized facts. Our findings are that just before elections, you see improved infrastructure being put in place by private sector firms who are putting in better equipment. And our sort of explanation of why we think that is, is that citizens are evaluating the goods that are implemented just before elections uh, more heavily in their decision of who to vote for than just after. The paper is available and I look forward to the questions. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Dan, and especially, you know, for catching us up on time. So yeah, uh, well easy. done. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Paul, over to you. Sure. Um, so we should be in full screen now, right? I uh, not yet, but yes, we are now. No, we are. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is joint work with Richard and Roland. It's called Local Majorities, How Administrative Divisions Shape Comparative Development. Uh, quick disclaimer, we claim it's via local majorities, um, <clears throat> hence the title. Uh, the motivation for this paper is that we can observe in many ethnically diverse countries that ethnic voting and other practices quite often favor specific groups. These groups tend to be majorities to some degree, um, but we know very little about the ethnic composition of administrative units. And as um, just a couple of weeks ago, Martin Kimani from the Kenyan delegation reminded us many African countries have inherited quite diverse countries with fixed national borders that are hard to change, but internally, there are many policies possible. And if you think back in time, we had massive centralizations in Africa. And more recently, we had unit proliferation, so territorial decentralization, also advocated by uh, international organizations such as the World Bank. However, given that we know very little about the internal effects of this distribution, um, we cannot say if they favor some groups or others. Um, and a big problem if we want to make causal statements is, of course, that given that countries can change their internal units by themselves, it's likely that this process might be captured by either economically or politically powerful groups um, that make a border design or submissional division that favors them. What we're going to do in this paper is we're going to exploit European ignorance uh, in the early consolidation period of the uh, colonies, particularly the French colonial empire and use the quasi-random design of the subnational structure within primarily French West Africa um, to obtain exogenous group shares of ethnic groups uh, that allows us to compare how majority groups fare compared to minority groups. So that's the goal of this paper. Um, as a takeaway from the beginning, uh, what we find is that uh, the administrative divisions of countries are indeed not distributionally neutral. That does not mean that they are there are some nefarious mechanisms that way, uh, but we find several mechanisms that suggest that majorities are just passively, to a certain degree, um, benefiting from the structure that is in place. Um, all right. Let me illustrate the paper in one slide. Here you can see the former uh, French Guinea, nowadays Guinea. You see in the black borders the Murdoch ancestral homelands. We take Murdoch because it arguably depicts the spatial distribution of these groups prior to colonization. Um, and in blue, you can see the initial subnational division of back then French Guinea, uh, the districts or circles, I cannot pronounce this properly. And what we can observe is that the Fuja Geelong as a large group, for example, tend up to be to different degrees majorities in, difference of, in different of these uh, districts. So are other groups, right? So the large groups tend to have in general some districts where they are very dominant. And then if you go closer to their homeland borders, it's a bit more mixed. Uh, the contributions of these papers are several. First, we generated a lot of new data. So we gathered uh, this in initial colonial administrative structure for all countries of Sub-Saharan Africa between 19 and 1920. So it's all digitized military and atlas maps, uh, quite often official colonial maps um, that we now have in digital form and hopefully going to distribute soon as we are uh, under revision or accepted at some journal. Uh, we also provide new causal evidence that local majorities indeed causally affect the economic development of places and people. So it's not just linked to the place, but the historic majority groups fare better wherever they are located within the country. Um, this, of course, adds also to how generally the colonial treatment has affected the pattern of spatial development across Africa. Um, 
But what our study emphasizes is that while this territorial structure is to a large part persistent, also, also the internal structure, it is by no way mutable, and there have been changes, and these changes seem to matter. And that's what we're currently mostly working on to trace out where this persistent breaks down and where not. Uh, so we gathered in the meantime the full, let's say, subnational history of borders within African countries between 19, around 1910 to today. Um, that's the work in progress part of the paper. All right. Uh, let me just briefly discuss some issues on data and colonial design. So data-wise, I mentioned this, we just gather lots of data from historical sources and try to usually verify historical colonial maps, which can be a bit more imprecise just because of the time that they were drawn with uh, military maps that have been prepared largely during the First World War and then updated by the Germans in preparation of their African war. Um, so that we have just higher resolution of the same initial divisions. Um, and that's then cross-verified with uh, historical budgets and further maps. Um, we roughly have close to 600 colonial districts uh, in 40 sub-Saharan countries, but primarily going to rely on the French uh, case for identification. Um, ethnic maps come from Murdoch, and historical population estimates come from Hyde. We cross-validate them for our spatial resolution, where they seem to perform quite well given historical population numbers for these districts. All right, this is the example again, how we get to the data. This is the map from 1922 of uh, French Guinea. These are the districts that we can extract. These are the Murdoch homelands. We intersect the two and you get the map that I showed you in the beginning. Um, yeah, this is the full sample of districts we have for Africa. This is again the intersect of Murdoch. Um, <clears throat> outcomes, um, as many, we use nighttime lights as the primary outcomes uh, because we can measure it everywhere. Uh, we also use the DHS to a large degree, but uh, the DHS or the clustering of DHS clusters uh, lets us lose about a third of our homelands. That's just because smaller homelands tend to have a lower chance to be represented, right? And of course, we also have a heavy uh, overrepresentation of the capital city area in the DHS, uh, but the results are consistent between the different data sources. We have also tons of geographic controls that we use on homelands, districts, or grid cells. The grid cells analysis will not be part of today's talk. Um, here we follow the literature, particularly rivers and lakes, because that's what Europeans were taught back in their school, how you should draw a border, find a river, draw a border, find a lake, draw a border, find a mountain, draw a border. Um, that's the, what was taught back then. And then also crop suitability, the distance to coast, to proxy for the general information people had, uh, malaria burden, and so forth. Uh, what is for us very important is the pre-colonial characteristics of the groups, right? So major worry is that groups that are favored by the Europeans are selected into local majorities, which would kind of reintroduce this endogeneity problem that uh, current borders suffer, current administrative units suffer. Um, here we do some balancing uh, based on, again, Murdoch Atlas variables and can reject, or not reject, that it does not discriminate, at least in the French case. Looks entirely different for the Brits. Brits seem to have picked their winners in line with qualitative evidence. Let me talk about the majority concept. So the, the core measure for the local analysis is just the district share of your group. So it's a continuous measure, uh, arguably a 50%, you are a clear majority, but you can be a large majority or just the largest group. Um, you use the continuous measure because it is the most forgiven with respect to small measurement errors in terms of the homeland and district borders. Uh, we can aggregate this up to the expectation of a group. So just aggregating up is this homeland more often than not a majority uh, compared to a minority, again, compared to other homelands. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's what's going on in the major part of the paper. Um, here again, we can illustrate this with our case. This is the map that you've already seen. This is how it looks if I aggregate it up to the homelands. So you can see the Fuji Geelong in general seem to have even a smoother deal than the Suzu or the Malinke. Um, there's also variation in the smaller groups. Um, depends again on your initial population distribution. All right, identification and main results. So this is the main specification for the homeland level. That's the only thing I'm showing you today. But what's actually the main part of the paper is about is the, the local, the district level, where we can identify within homeland differences and also across borders. But that's uh, that's uh, not. Uh, permissible given the time constraint. So we're going to uh, uh, regress the log uh, light density on this local majority measure. So the expectation on the homeland level, we're going to have protectorate fixed effects, a vector of the controls that we also use for balancing. And our identifying assumption is, of course, that these homelands have not been selected with respect to any other unobservables that influence economic development today. 
Um, so the French really help us in several degrees. First, there has been a large debate uh, to which should be actually the right resolution of the primarily French administrative uh, structure. There have been arguments in favor for villages. Other officials wanted larger units. Um, but great for us, uh, after initial discussions, also from different people involved in colonization, they decided one uh, rule and they implemented across the entire empire. So even if the, the final structure might have been inspired by a colonial officer in some specific colony, it was rolled out uniformly across the whole French uh, African empire. And that of course uh, limits or minimizes the influence of any particular group. Moreover, there's a lot of evidence that power was not shared with local group and also the assignment of district governors was rather arbitrary. So this recent paper by Duet Al, um, that also goes into our favor. But of course, there's also quantitative evidence so we can run a balancing exercise. And similar to Michaelopoulos and Papania, we find that the mechanical uh, determinants, just the size of the homeland and the population density will, for any set of orders that potentially can be drawn, of course, lead to a higher expected share. So that's going to be the baseline controls that have to be present at all time for the comparison of the homelands and conditional on size and population density. Uh, the local majority measure should be plausibly exogenous. Well, yeah, five These minutes. are the main results. That's great. Then these are the main results. As you can see, fading in the protectorate fixed effects and the vector of controls changes the point estimate of the EPS rather limited. This is not too surprising and also highlights that the French basically did in all of their protectorates the same administrative policy. So uh, in British, uh, in a British sample, you will observe much more differences once you include protectorate fixed effects or not. Um, in terms of magnitude, let's talk about standard deviations. So a group that has a one standard deviation higher uh, expected local majority or population share has nighttime lights of about 40% higher, which given elasticities that pump around in the literature, you can interpret as a regional GDP differences of the homeland by about 12%, so quite substantial. Uh, we talk about 2015 numbers here. Uh, we can do tons of robustness, which are not super interesting and which I would skip for the talk. So let's talk about extensions and mechanisms instead. So first, we do indeed uh, document that quite a lot of those borders are persistent. So many of today's first or second order subnational units have borders that are within 10 kilometers of these initial borders. However, it's not just the past borders or the past majorities that influence current development. If groups are put in a better position later on, they seem to catch up to some degree. It's also not just limited to the place. As I mentioned before, using DHS surveys, we can show that people some of these benefits are mobile, particularly with respect to health uh, and education. Um, and we do find external validity. So the British colony effects are much larger actually, but there we are suspecting selection to a large degree, right? So the, the groups that have these large local majorities have probably already been better in advance. Um, on the district level, where we can shut this channel down by using homeland fixed effects within countries, we still observe that the British point coefficients are substantially larger than the French, uh, suggesting that indeed in more decentralized countries, local majorities matter more. So if those countries are reformed, the non-neutral character of this uh, administrative structure with uh, respect to um, the distribution of economic activity might matter even more. Uh, there are several mechanisms why the historical uh, majorities matter today. So first of all, a lot of these majorities received the back then district capitals. That's also where most of the early investments occurred in French colonial Africa, think about roads, think about railways, but also think about communication infrastructure. So we digitized early post telephone and uh, telegraph stations. Uh, again, all very important markers also for the concept of uh, effective rule. Uh, and those spread from these capitals into the proximate hinterland. So you observe a much higher density of this communication infrastructure in historical local majority homelands compared to others. Um, I mentioned the health and education. Uh, results already. Let me close with the migration results. So it seems also that not only we think that these uh, majorities matter, but also people. Um, if we use IPOMS data for a set of uh, French West African countries, we can observe that if people uh, born in districts that intersect their ancestral homeland and where they have an estimated higher population share, if they migrate, they migrate within their own homeland to a district in which there are even a larger majority or for sure no minority. And in general, majorities migrate less compared to non-majorities. 
particularly oh, towards uh, rule settings. You have two more. I'm minutes. done. Oh, perfect. Oh, then let me just then just let me take the main takeaway once more. So uh, what we're going to show here is that the administrative divisions of countries are not distributionally neutral uh, in ethnically diverse countries, and uh, we believe this is an important uh, finding that policymakers should consider uh, when they think about how to generate economies of scales with district mergers or increase uh, public services when you talk about making smaller units or district proliferation, which has been a prominent policy in the last couple of decades. Um, yeah, I would say I sacrifice my last minute for discussion. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. It was a very uh, great set of papers and I'm quite excited about the upcoming discussion. So uh, for those of us who join us uh, later, you can either put your question in the, in the Q&A or you can raise your hand and I can call on you to, to ask your question. As you do that, there was a, some of the panelists have actually started asking questions to each other. So maybe, uh, I saw that Eleanor had a question. Do you wanna, you wanna start with you, with your question and then we can, we can wait to see if more people have, have questions in the, in the attendance list. Sure, shall I start? I think my question was for, for Dan's paper and I think he already replied in the chat, but I can uh, repeat I it. No, yes, I was just curious about what you meant by uh, political disruptions, given that you say that this doesn't seem to play a role in, in what you observe. And uh, I was just wondering about heterogeneity actually, whether the jump that you identify is different of different size, depending on whether a leader or a party stays in power or depending on whether there is a change in leadership. That was my question. Yeah, very good question. And I replied that um, we look at exactly those two things. So violence around the election, uh, heterogeneous effect, and also whether the party stays in power, we don't see heterogeneity on those two margins. I had a couple of questions and Juliet has raised her hand. Should I? suggest mine Julian or yeah, should we do later? Go ahead I just wanted to say uh, I have some questions I didn't just didn't think about writing them in the chat but yeah go ahead and then <laughs> no, no I mean so interesting um so Julia, on yours um I kind of think about public policy in Congo differently to say Tanzania um and so how do we just how do we think about that because in Congo isn't that Bates first argument was that we actually don't build roads, we don't have policy that's national, so that we can, um, uh, you know, kind of inhibit the ability to take the capital, that we inhibit the, the, the sort of reach of the central state. So, because I, I felt like it was a homogenous idea that public policies across countries. And then um, I also, so, so yeah, so do, do we think that the um, extent to which public policy has impact across the country is part of the endogeneity of the political settlement. And then what I was also thinking is, um, you know, in some sense, do we think that, um, yeah, I said, do we, you know, do we think that the elites at the center, that there's not a power sharing agreement sort of is endogenous within them? So I, I, I felt like there was some very interesting, um, ideas, but I just, I worried that we were making kind of homogenous statements about quite a disparate set of variables. So I'd love to hear that. And then Juliet, so I was thinking about, do we think that land reform might affect demand for education? Um, and I also wondered if you have maps of the ancestral homelands. I really like that that links in with Paul so that you could kind of interact the two. So, you know, do people want to live on one side of the, the homeland? But actually, the farmer didn't care about that. And therefore, you've got this nice kind of orthogonality between the two. And then finally is, um, could you get something about social cohesion that's got nothing to do with the state provision? So there's this, obviously this paper when we go on, on which hunts and which burn, something kind of that's purely social. I think that'd be really interesting. Shall I start answering your questions then? Or Juliette, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> Well, go ahead, Elena. There's also some, yeah. there's some background noise coming from somewhere. I'm not sure if somebody yes, needs to. Yes, that's true. Uh, I, thanks, Paul. I think that helps. <laughs> Great. No, thanks, Dan. So, of course, it's always a trade-off, right, when you, when you want to look at a phenomenon and you think, okay, should I focus on a specific context or should I take an entire continent and draw conclusions? So, uh, thanks for pointing that out, and I totally agree. Uh, on the concerns you raise. So perhaps let me start by the issue of endogeneity. So there could be 
a lot uh, happening when there is a change in uh, the ethnic identity of the government, right? So you made several examples. And I'm sorry that during the talk, I didn't mention this, but a crucial identifying assumption in my setting is that of course, um, there shouldn't be uh, any endogeneity in the sense we are not expecting that the timing of a change in the ethnic identity of the government is completely exogenous. But what I'm doing de facto in my analysis is I compare whether I compare two groups of ethnicities, those that after a government change will become culturally closer to the government to the group of ethnicities that after a government change become culturally more distant. And I wonder whether you know, there is an increase or a de in decrease in the propensity of, to fight. I also provide graphical evidence. And of course, the identifying assumption here is that prior to a government change, I shouldn't observe differential trends in conflict involvement across these two groups of ethnicities. So to alleviate the endogeneity concern you brought up when it comes to changing the ethnic identity of the government, I show that indeed this does not seem to be the case. There are no differential trends across these two groups of ethnicities. But then you mentioned, okay, there might be other things that make certain governments differ from others. Um, and in that sense, a bit inclusion of country by year fixed effect, as long as these governmental characteristics affect all ethnic groups in a country should be captured there. But then your question points to future avenues for my paper, which I think would be super interesting to do to try to explore heterogeneity, right? These countries are very different. And uh, what is still missing in my paper is exploring and going down that route, exploiting the fact that I have multiple countries and dig deeper and see in which contexts groups react more or less to cultural distance. So thank you very much. And I saw also you sent me an email with your paper. I'll read it with pleasure. And thanks so much for your advice. Thanks. Uh, Julia, do you want to answer? And then we can move to Paul for his question. Yes. And uh, I'm going to answer and probably ask. For, can I ask first a couple of, no, let me answer and then I'll, I'll ask more, a couple of questions. So regarding whether land reform should affect demand for education, uh, probably in a sense, I would think of it in way similar to income effects. So um, I would, because they, I mean, if they are, uh, at least that would be my first um, instinct, but to think that in this case, it's all agricultural land, and it's actually quite similar on both um, sides of the border. So I don't really see why the fact that it's a land reform, especially in the selling of either you you took a land at the bank and then bought land from a from a land buying company, or you have to reimburse the land to the government. I'm not sure that would really change demand for education, but I'll, I'll think more think more about it maps of the ancestral homelands oh uh, yeah I, guess, I mean i guess we could use murdoch um <laughs> uh, and probably one thing i'm trying to find is the exact maps of this african land units also to know where they stopped exactly because they're also assigned to ethnic groups and try to do something about it and i didn't show you the maps but we indeed see that during the colonial period in the, this all like European settler area is extremely mixed. So you see Kikuyu working like exactly in the other part of the country. And it's really like, it was quite mixed on the farms and I'm not sure exactly why, if it was also a strategy of the settlers to take people from different ethnic groups or why this was happening. Um, let's see if we can find something about it. But yeah, we'll try with, with the homelands and then winch hunts. Uh, yes, that would be interesting. I'll see if uh, the data is available or if we can get uh, something. Thanks for the suggestions. And to kind of close the loop, I should ask the question to Paul, but um, I think I must have questions for Nora. I wanted to ask you about how we should think about time in the in the uh, oh like things like assimilation and the fact that cultural distances between groups might 
slowly reduce or increase with things like scholarization in a common language. I, for this, I've worked on inter-ethnic mergers in sub-Saharan Africa, so and they are mostly increasing over time. So as it's clear, like this distances and the boundaries of groups are changing over time. So how uh, just is it something you can look at and do we see less of an effect over time? And then uh, I was wondering whether you've done something, I'm sure you've tried, but dropping groups that, considering only groups that are never in the government are trying to, because I find like that it's, controlling for, for the fact that you're in the government and still looking at the effects of linguistic distance is a bit weird to me. I was uh, would like to maybe first see something like you're in government or you're not in government and for do more something like an interaction maybe of um, and different effects of language uh, based on whether you made it into the government or not. Yeah, thanks, Juliet. So the first question is super fascinating, and it goes a bit towards the way I measure cultural distance. This is the most established way of, of doing this, and it's looking at, you know, which languages members of a given ethnic group speak. And when it comes to Africa, we are talking about like the traditional languages and not much like the colonizers languages. And the argument always put forward is, well, this measure is good because it's kind of exogenous, um, given that these type of traits, meaning language, tend to be more slow moving. But of course, as you mentioned, we are missing out on, uh, you know, the exchange between groups and inter-ethnic marriages may be one of the reasons why we may see uh, cultural assimilation. And I here I don't have anything to say about it. Of course, for my analysis, Linguistic distance is good because it's kind of more exogenous than any other measure that would take into account what you are pointing out, uh, because it could be still very endogenous to conflict, right, to the probability that two groups will engage in conflict. So this is certainly interesting, and I, I have nothing to say about it. What I have to say about in my paper is I try to understand to actually address any remaining endogeneity concerns from using linguistic distance, and this is why I propose the instrument. Uh, but I do not look at uh, maybe perhaps more even more accurate measures of linguistic distance like the ones you propose. And as for the second question, I think there is, though, if you're interested in this, there is a lot of literature right now popping up in proposing new measures uh, and new ways of measuring cultural differences. I'm thinking about the folklore work by Michalopoulos, but there is other uh, non-published yet work using machine learning algorithms and looking way deeper into languages and words. And I can send you the references if you're interested. Um, and as for the second question, yes, in the paper, I do run those uh, exercises that you were proposing, like looking at whether groups who are represented in government react more to cultural distance than others. So I don't not only control for these dimensions, but I also run the interaction term and I do not find this to be the case, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not. And the way I measure at the ethnic identity of the government is quite broad because I'm using the ethnic power relations data set, which includes multiple groups, depending on whether, you know, they are represented in any type of executive power. So I'm not just looking at the, you know, the primary leader, but at a government in a broader sense. And uh, this is why, you know, dropping groups that are never, ever represented will leave me with a kind of selected sample and a smaller sample of groups. So thank you. Great. Um, Paul, there is a question for you in the Q&A. Maybe you want to answer that and then you can ask your question. Or you want me to, can you access it or do you want me to read uh, it? Yeah, wait, um, works. Can you read it? Sorry, I'm a bit slow with my one <clears throat> hand. That's all right. Uh, so it's a question for Michael Kivan. It's, he, the question is, it seems like the framing uh, local majorities are good for development. Is that the contrary of ethnic fragmentation is bad for development or is it more nuanced? In terms of uniformity of this creation, was it perhaps not more nuanced? I'm thinking of things like the cat commune in Senegal and other special administrative units. Are they just treated as noise? Along the French British borders, there were major population movements during the colonial era. Does the paper have any insights on this? 
Um, thanks for the question. So for the population movement uh, between the uh, French and British, uh, we have not yet any insights, but uh, let me note that down. Um, French movements. Um, the, the special zones are huge in the core sample ignored. We do tons of robustness where we kind of exclude all types of split homelands. So that gets probably already a bit to get uh, towards the population movements between colonies. Uh, we also exclude capital areas because what I didn't mention maybe too precise in the presentation is that you need to make some kind of an homogeneity assumption with respect to the inhabitants of the homelands uh, at the earlier, earliest point of where we have these administrative units, right? And that's of course very implausible for the areas where you have the colonial capital uh, and certain other regions. Uh, the way we currently deal with it that we just have tons of robustness where we throw all this kind of special or problematic or interesting areas away and the effects turn out to be very very stable um, so um, is it more nuanced i would say it is more nuanced uh, because what we actually argue is it's not so much if the if the location is fractionalized or not we we look we take a group perspective right and say well if it's good to be in a majority or not uh, and the the current policy implication would be that well actually it's in favor of partitioning groups within a country right um there's not a statement for within group partitioning so as long as you you keep them by themselves but turns out that and and this might be passive right um if you have if you have one political center and it's more friendly language wise to people from the dominant group you will have some passive majority effects that make it easier for those to succeed compared to the minorities so that's that's how far i would be willing to to go currently um, of course, there are other trade-offs that you might face. Shall I go over to my questions or? Yeah, that, if that's your answer then. Uh, <laughs> All right, um, so I would go chronologically. So uh, Eleanor, I have, I think two or three questions actually. So uh, I was wondering, did you ever try out the France wide all data? So the, the cabinet shares, um, there is now a R package that allows an easier match of their grouping towards other maps like Greg or Ethnolog. Uh, Leda package, I don't know if you've heard of it. The Leda, um, L-E-D-A, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's, yeah. that's the one I use for matching All right. our groups to, to the murder atlas group. I think it's, it's right. fantastic as a, yeah. as a reason. Because I mean, yeah. Because I mean, the, the, the variation in groups in Francois would be a bit broader, right? Uh, EPR is a bit selected that you cannot get rid of groups that are never super relevant because they are not in the data set uh, yeah. to begin with. Yeah, right. You're right. So, yeah. Uh, and I guess you could also exploit this to come a bit closer to the theory because if I mem remember Esteban et al. correctly, right, we are worried about public policies that are very far from our preferences. And so certain ministers should, should just matter a lot. So. If I think of Edward, if the education minister is super far away from my linguistic line, I don't know what else interior. I mean, there must, there must be some ministries that do not really matter in terms of just public policy so much, right? right. While others might be, might be super salient uh, and maybe you can get to that. Um, then something to clarify, do you weight the linguistic distance of the people in government by the population? So yes, this is related to the previous question actually that you asked. So let me answer. Yeah. This. Um, yeah. Um, the idea is that the EPR database a bit takes into account the relevance and the importance of given positions yeah. within the government because you have. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk about it, but you have among groups you have senior partners and junior partners, and the idea is that the senior partner has more executive power as compared to the junior partner, and then when I compute the linguistic distance between a given potential rebel and the ethnicities in the government, I wait by, so as you, as you may know, within a given EPR group, there might be multiple languages. So EP, the EPR database gives you up to three languages and their relative size. So I weight the distance by this type of population. And then I also propose two alternative measures of linguistic distance to the government, right? To the whole yeah. set of groups forming the government. I provide a weighted measure in which the senior partner has more weight than the junior partner, as well as an unweighted measure where I just take it. Right. And it doesn't change much. Oh. All right, very cool. And that's the, probably the last related issue. Um, this does in a certain way already account for ethnic families, right? If we, if we think to 
to Greg or Ethnolog, you have this cultural groups or even Murdoch. So it would be a policy recommendation that it already gets better if you have some signaling participation or is it really just the important points? So again, there, Francois, with the important and maybe general That's true. posts might be interesting, right? So like how, far, how much do you need to be included in order to avoid, avoid these exactly. issues? And I think that, yes, you're right, absolutely. And it would be nice to look at how results look using the Francois data set. Also because I think the, in that data set, you have a more fine grained and more, you have more temporal variation, I guess, also, right? Because uh, cabinet members change like more frequently than what EPR would mark as a change in the ethnic yeah. identity of the government. So that's, you're absolutely right. And that's something to, to be added. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, thanks. Then very briefly, just two points to uh, Juliette, because uh, I work with this old map so much. So there is actually official British tribal map from 1948 uh, for all the tribes in East Africa. Uh, it includes Kenya, and it's much more fine-grained uh, than the ethnic groups because it's actually on the chief level. So uh, the, it's the chiefdoms that, uh, that are recorded. Um, we can talk, I didn't digitize it myself, so I need to ask one of my co-authors if, if he's willing to share it, but it's a public source, so I can send you for sure a link <laughs> if I find it again. Um, that might help. And then the, the Kikuyu effect is something I'm really worrying about, right? There have been concentration camps just before independence. White highlands are predominantly uh, Kikuyu lands, Miru, Embu, uh, and you... No, they're, they're not. The white highlands, no, 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 they're not. If I show you the map again, you'll see one part is one part is Kikuyu and it's still Kikuyu. There is this whole western part that is Luya and then Kalenjin. Kalenjin. Yeah. No, no, it's not. It's not but mainly Kikuyu. That's, that's, that's the it. second. <laughs> but that's the second part of the point, right? After independence, when you had Kenyatta as the president, there was a quite substantial settlement of Kikuyus outside of their traditional homelands. And in the post-election violence of uh, 2007, uh, beginning of 2008, a lot of Kikuyus were displaced, uh, partic particularly within the Luo and Kalijin areas, right? So at the, I'm just interesting, I'm not saying that, that the, the paper does not work, but I'm interesting if, if there's an issue that Kikuyus, particularly in the beginning, had, might have had easier access to loans and that a particular group basically drives the change in diversity. So it's, ba it's basically outside of Kikuyu, the question would be is outside of Kikuyu homeland, the, the increase in diversities in this location is primarily driven by Kikuyu, or is it uh, driven by all kinds of groups? I guess that that's just something to trace out, right? It's not a problem in I, a sense. Yeah, it's, I, it's can, just... I can tell you about it. All right, yes. cool. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the suggestion regarding the maps. If if you can share the link, but also if you have the digitized file, that would be awesome. But at least thanks for the reference. Regarding the homelands, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, it's not my computer, so I can't show you the maps because they're, they're stored on my. <laughs> but um, basically, it's very, the, if you, if I were to show you the map using the census of uh, 62 with only like removing the, the Europeans from it, you see this uh, skits, um, European settler area are very mixed, except for kind of the Nyandahua, but the part that is the closer to the traditional Kikuyu areas, where it's more Kikuyu, also because there's basically only Kikuyu kind of in the in the catchment area of these farms. Whereas like in the rest, it's mixed, but you're also it's mostly in the West. You see Luya and Luo people mixed and some mostly Kalenjin people. And so what happens just in terms of the history, they did follow these rules of, so yeah, that's something I didn't say. So when they decided to allocate the land, the idea was to extend this African land units. So it's really, there was this Luo reserve and then they were like, okay, this part, we're gonna add it to the Luya one. And so we don't see Kikuyu. So the, it's true, there was also like this Kikuyu settlement schemes in which a lot of Kikuyu people were kind of dumped right before the elections, um, the first elections. But it's not like it's not like they are dumped anywhere in the country. Like they are in this in this um, um, Kikuyu area, and in a sense, they got more land, but they got it from like these areas that were uh, Maasai Kikuyu 
conflicted areas. So many people in Kenya would say, oh, you go to this part, now it's only queer people, but all the names of places are Maasai. So like the group who lost in a way at the Maasai, we didn't get any land back in this, um, this European settler area after, the, after independence. And so what we did with the uh, Luya, the Kalenjin and the Kikuyu is we use this uh, ethnic group fixed effect, but also we kind of use kind of, we assign the ethnicity of the majority to the border segments. And so we run it only with the Luya border segment, only with the Kalenjin one, only with the Kikuyu one, and basically it's zero effects everywhere. Though we do find that in some places like the average number of schools in Kikuyu areas is higher than the average number of school in Kalenjin and Luya area. So we do find this, you know, <laughs> discrepancies, but it's not, it's not the effect with the null effect we find is not about, it's not a Kikuyu story or not a Kikuyu story. But thanks, yeah, thanks for the question. Cool, thank you. Uh, Eleanor, can I just jump in and ask a question before you ask yours? Um, <clears throat> actually, I have one question for you and one question for Dan. The question for you is like, I'm wondering whether the, the geographic distributions of ethnic groups also matters because if I'm if it's all about kind of policies and I'm guessing a lot of those states the main group like if public goods are going to be quite geographically specific so if there's lots of ethnic diversity at the local level rather than like groups kind of groups being kind of segregated in different parts of the country the effect of distance might actually be weaker because the government is going to build things that are pretty close to me and so I don't really care so it might be if there might be some um, I know there's some work in like, there's a couple of papers in APSR recently looking at like ethnic kind of diversity in a geographical sense rather than just kind of overall and so there might be something yeah. you could you could look at. That's a great idea for, for heterogeneity. Yes, yes, I haven't thought about it yet. And Dan, so I was really surprised by those results by the election. I was, you know, I would have bet quite a lot of money but the effects would go the other way. And so I'm trying to think of why. And one uh, one thing, and I don't know, obviously you might have done this in the paper, you and it printed quite quickly, is do you have a, a sense of like you might you might argue that places where that are provided with goods before the elections are places that are a bit more kind of electorally sensitive or politically salient. And so I'm just wondering whether there's an issue of like kind of one of like where they place the things before the election versus after that might be I could explain the, the long run effect but also like in a way what you observe now is like the construction conditional on the maintenance in the in the intervening years and so is there a way that like you know maybe I build a borehole in like the early 80s and then before every election and go and fix it and what you see is you see the kind of the overall effect of that and so I don't know if there's anything you Maybe if you kind of looked at only the ones from like recent elections and you find the same results, maybe that's not that, but it would be interesting to see whether that's that's a potential I'll explanation. Off, um, for another meeting, I'm so sorry. So let me quickly come in. We did five things. So one is um, we looked at political competition by heterogeneity, we don't find effects. Next is, of course, um, because of the fixed effects we have and controls, we are looking at the water points in the same community, you know, in quite small district areas, right? So I agree with you, that was a, that's, that could have been a concern if we didn't have such high frequency data where you're literally seeing water points either side and then kind of conditioning on districts. Um, we've done stuff about kind of, you know, the markets and technology and, and kind of altitude change. We've done balance tables on, you know, kind of as much as we can either side. It is funny though, so you're the third person today because Stefan emailed me and another um, presenter emailed me. I was like, I thought it would go the other way. I think for me, the way we're articulating this is um, the intersection between the two is relatively limited uh, between political economy here and, and this kind of infrastructure work. And I think it's, I, I kind of didn't have an ex ante. So, you know, I, I think it's going to be hard for us to push very hard on the mechanism side because there will always be a story. But in some sense, the fact that we get these, you know, these three independent, it, it, as I said, we took the best data we could from that water point thing and we find the same uh, coherent uh, kind of results. So we've done as much as I think we can with the data. If you do see anything that you don't think we've done, we can do it. But um, I think we're kind of pushing at the fact, and this goes to Eleanor's point is, in some sense, because we're taking 
the whole country, all the elections, that period, there's benefits to that. If we get very close, so if we take like the last election, obviously the sample collapses, we get much smaller numbers. Right? So I have to go, it's so nice to be with all of you and uh, wishing you a great rest of your session. Thanks. I don't know, you wanna conclude quickly and then we can let everybody Yes, go. I had a question for Paul, but I can also jump to my question for Juliet, if you guys don't mind, uh, otherwise we can leave, obviously. Uh, are we getting kicked out? Otherwise, I mean, what I can do is I can kind of close the session, but you can go and then we can stay and then you can, you can kind of ask the question, especially just wanted to remind everyone there's another political economy session in 30 minutes. So feel free to, to come to that as well. But uh, mm -hmm. the session itself, uh, Amira, let's not close down the session yet. And then we can have a chat between ourselves before we close this Zoom call. Okay. So thanks. Thanks to all of you for the presentation. Thanks. So Juliet, I just have a very broad and, and kind of philosophical question. Maybe you've, man, you've mentioned this in your talk, but why do you think your results are so different from, you know, the old, not old school, but well-established literature in the end of the 90s and so when it comes to diversity and the size of public goods? I mean, what is this really what is so specific here and uh, do you think it has to do with the fact well we know this literature empirically well, we know the theoretical arguments but empirically it was always kind of not so well identified right we have cross sections of i don't know u.s cities in alizina's paper um do you think it has to do with this with the fact that yours is such a way more controlled uh, empirical exercise or is there some mechanism uh that is typical to this context, is it switching from more diversity to less? What is it? What, what do you think is going on? Thanks. Thanks for the question. So it's a bit puzzling also to us because in a way our prior was that we would probably see no effects after 50 years, either because of sorting or because people ad adjust to, you know, cooperation always from this Miguel and Gugerti paper on like how much people contribute to the funding for, for, for schools in Kenya. Uh, very strange. So it's like these people have been living in the same place for, you know, centuries without major conflicts and then they still cannot cooperate. So I always found it like just a bit hard to believe. Yeah. And so we, but we were what we were expecting is maybe in this more homogeneous communities to see like that they would provide public goods faster, that they would be more community schools in the in in the first period, and then the the other area would maybe catching up. So that's I think um, that might be what is going on, but we don't we we would like, and that's what we would like to test and. Um, also because that would make kind of the old literature with the newer literature consistent in a sense you're like you say it's social net ethnic diversity really proxies for social networks so if you resettle people on both sides they like these social networks though so if they share a language or sometimes share a language um uh they there is some, you know, they form social ties more quickly. And then maybe that's the way if it goes this way, which makes me think about one question to you. And then maybe you can ask your question to Paul and then we can stop. But my question is how you deal with this heterogeneity within, within groups. So some are like, because some groups are like not even not ethnic groups in the way most people think of them, whether it's the Kalenjin or the Midikenda, but even like the Luya, people speak different dialects and they cannot understand each other necessarily. Yes, that's a good point. So, of course, my analysis abstract from this because I have ethnicity fixed effect and the idea is that the diversity winning groups to some extent is time invariant, but you've previously said it's not. Um, and yeah, the idea is that I'm really focusing on distance between groups. I take into account, so if members of a given group speak multiple languages or different languages, that would be captured by my measure of cultural distance. But I remain completely silent on the role of within group heterogeneity. There is this paper by Odette Galore 
that looks at you know genetic distance distances within groups and and the impact of conflict in that case then my suggestion would be if you have enough cases and enough knowledge it would be to, to do so uh, have a and uh, now i do it for you just use a different category for groups that are homogeneous mm -hmm. in terms of language so to keep up with the um can you example the kikuyu and then another for the ones that are like where we know they speak different dialects or different languages of this more company or the bambara or like things that are groups that have um, more diversity in terms of language and maybe then you can say something about exactly this. and look at heterogeneity again i think my my takeaway from today is uh run heterogeneity analysis and along, along what julian was was suggesting and you as well so that's super cool thank you and thanks paul also for your comment i i saw that in the chat and uh, it's noted uh since we are anyway stretching your time uh I mean, if you have the neighboring groups, that's that's probably right. When you have intermingling, that's that's the one whose public policies, if implemented, most affect you. So if you if you think about Esteban again, right? If it's right. if at the other end of the country they they get Christian schools and I'm of another faith, I don't care, right? If the Christian Fair schools enough. are built in my village, I might care. Uh, something like that. Oh, good point. Uh, you wanted to say something to me, or? Uh, uh, no, I think no. I had a question for for Dan, but he's gone. So another take. Great. Uh, so thanks a lot, everyone. It was really great and engaging. And I uh, hope to see you in uh, 22 minutes on the other side.